Now, regardless of the research design, we have to think about certain concerns. We've already mentioned ethics and safety. It's worth mentioning it again briefly, of course. But when you're getting ready to do a training, let's say you're going to take a group of people into a lab, do a driving simulator, offer them brownies that may or may not contain cannabis. There is a lot of research training involved in that. You want to make sure your research assistants say the exact same thing to the groups when they pass out the brownies, that they get the same training on the driving simulator. Even if you're just doing an online survey, you need to train people to analyze it properly and distribute it and advertise it properly. You want to make sure your methods and materials are completely accurate. You want to make sure the dosage of cannabis you're putting into the brownies is even. You don't have one brownie that has too much of the potency and some brownies that should have potency that don't. You also want to make sure that your online surveys are asking the things you need them to ask. You want to make sure the driving simulator is properly uh, uh, activated and that it doesn't need any other configuration. You want to make sure there's no glitches in the software. And finally, if you go through the length of assessing a group of people, you want to make sure the people in your study are diverse and representative enough that you can generalize your study. For example, if you're only looking at undergrads, you're looking at undergrad romantic relationships, you can certainly publish that as a look at young adult uh, romantic relationships. However, you can't say all romantic relationships if there's no one over the age of 25 in your study. It just doesn't work like that. And so if you're only looking at students from a certain ethnic background or a certain income, uh, you need to understand that you're not going to be able to generalize your theory to people from all walks of life. This is why we need to have diverse participants. In addition to this, we also need to think about participant bias. Sometimes participants uh, really want to help us with our research like really want to help us to the point they're trying to think of our hypothesis. They're trying to figure out the study so they can answer accordingly. That will prove our study right. They actually just want to help us get the significance. That can lead to some major response biases where a participant is trying to find out uh, what we're trying to analyze and they're lying or not being completely truthful or they're exaggerating on the measures. Perhaps someone wants to prove that cannabis is dangerous in a driving simulator, so they think they have the cannabis brownie and they get into the driving simulator, they intentionally crash because they want to see cannabis outlawed. Perhaps somebody wants to keep cannabis legal and so they uh, don't fully chew their cannabis brownie or they try extra hard in the driving simulator. That is going to muck up our results. In addition, uh, perhaps some people uh, don't want to show uh, them full selves. We see this a lot in surveys. We see this a lot when participants are so set on showing us their angelic side that they have a hard time admitting some of their shadows and some of the skeletons in their closet. Personality researchers find this a lot. Everyone has personality attributes that are less than socially desirable. Everyone has some times where they're clumsy or lazy or they're, they make mistakes. And when we ask them about that, uh, people tend to lie. People tend to lie when we ask them if they gossip about others or if they've never thought about stealing something. And so what we have to detect is those little white lies that make people seem like better versions of themselves. Sometimes they're not ready to admit that to themselves, let alone the researchers. They may not even be aware of it. And so we have to use very precise measures to detect that. We also find even if someone's being honest, sometimes they lose focus. Sometimes research studies are so long that a person kind of zones out when they're doing a survey or a test and it looks like they didn't perform well, but it's not because they were trying hard and didn't understand. It's because they lost focus or motivation. Sometimes uh, they are paying attention, but things that we assume they'll interpret in one way, they may interpret in another way. Great, great question that I had one time. I was uh, working with kids and doing a personality survey with kids. And one of the questions on the survey was, I feel blue. And they misunderstood that. Rather than thinking blue, depressed, and down, they were thinking perhaps they had circulation problems or they were cold and they were turning blue. So the same question could be interpreted in different ways from people who've had different life experiences. Finally, what we find is sometimes uh, participants will think they've cracked our code. They think they, they know what we're testing and they'll just start answering all the questions the same way. If they think, oh, they're testing about my relationship with my parents. I have a good relationship with my parents. I'm just going to put strongly agree with all those questions or I have a bad relationship with my parents. I'm going to put strongly disagree with all those questions. And they're not looking at the individual questions. We see this a lot on parent and teacher surveys where a teacher will say, oh, this student's a good student. I'm just going to put they do everything well. 
but they're not really um, paying attention to all the little variances. Not every student does everything perfect or everything terrible. This kind of overgeneralization is called the halo effect, where you treat everything as really positive or everything as really negative. The last one on this slide I want to talk about is the placebo effect. This is what happens if we give someone a brownie and we tell them there's cannabis in it, but there's not. Sometimes they will act like they are high on cannabis anyway. Now, most people who have eaten these brownies, they understand the smell, they understand other things, but it still happens with pills. We, we know that if we give someone a sugar pill and we say this sugar pill, you know, this pill is anti-anxiety, it should make you relaxed, or this one should make you hyper, people will still show the effects. Even if we say you're going to start this, it's going to do have this effect, those effects start to take place. This is one of the reasons we'd always make sure the procedure is matched in between subjects design uh, so that we make sure that we are uh, covering this placebo effect and accommodating it the best as we can. So people are not just acting on the placebo alone, that the true independent variable is having an effect. And in most cases with the brownies, we would not tell people if they have cannabis or not. And we would also uh, try and make sure they're, they're not aware of uh, what we're trying to study. Now, in terms of what goes on on the researcher side, we know there's lots of research bias. We know there's a lot of experimenter bias. For instance, uh, when an experimenter goes out to try and recruit participants, they may engage in what's called a sampling bias. This is the idea that they recruit people that are easy to recruit and not people that are diverse or representative. This is why we have a lot of undergrads. And for a long time in the United States, most undergrads were men uh, who have European heritage and of high income backgrounds. So because of this, the undergrads included in the study were only showing that perspective. And once we started to include more women, more people of color, more people of working class backgrounds, more people with disabilities, we started to find that some psychological theories uh, were more complex than we thought. So because of this, we want to try and get enough people in our study that we don't have a sampling bias. We also want to make sure we're aware of what an experimenter effect can do. So if a researcher really wants to prove that cannabis and driving will have an effect, we want to get that experimenter out of the room. We want to make sure the researchers who are passing out the brownies and the researchers who are monitoring the driving simulator don't know the hypothesis and don't have a stake in whether the, the project is significant or not. We also would like it if the researchers handing out the brownies don't know which brownies have cannabis, but that there's some way of keeping track. Uh, perhaps there's a serial code or each brownie's in like a little package or on a dish and there's a serial code and, and they don't know. Uh, that would probably be the best way to do it. Sometimes when we analyze kids and the kids have filled out a survey uh, and then we go to observe kids on the playground, the people observing on the playground don't know how those kids answered on the survey. So we don't know which kids answered on the survey that they're anxious or that they're aggressive. We're just watching them on the, on the playground, not knowing that. And that reduces the experimenter effect. We also want to be aware of measurement error. Uh, if there is a problem with our driving simulator, a problem with the brownies, that's going to lead to some major issues. And what's become more and more aware in the last couple of years in psychology is replication error. We can't just do one study once and assume it'll stand for all time. We must consistently do the same studies. So if somebody did a study that was groundbreaking in the 1960s, but nobody's ever attempted it again, it's really time to reattempt that. Because society has changed, we're in a different cultural historical period now, we need to see if it replicates and upholds. And if one person studies something, let's say bullying and gender, we need other people to examine bullying and gender in other places around the world to see if, those, if that association stands or if it's unique to that one person. So it's important to always replicate. This has been a problem in psychology because we tend to overvalue new studies and undervalue replication studies, uh, even though replication studies are very essential. And finally, there also could be a reporting error. This is the idea uh, that we, we found something, but the way we write it up is over-exaggerated or we misinterpret the data. So we absolutely need to be careful about this. There's so much to consider when we look at these research concerns. And so that's been an overview of the data collection. Next up, we'll be talking about analysis of data.